and welcome to the DC Today, our very special Monday extended version. And boy, is this one ever extended because uh, a few things have happened in the world. Our, our team took off for Nashville, Tennessee. We had an absolutely splendid couple of days of meetings and, and so forth out there. And in the meantime, we had a national election. We had uh, a big CPI report. We had the biggest market day up in, in over two years. And, and then we go into a weekend. And so there, there's a lot to cover. And the DC Today um, written has a lot of charts and is, is long, covers a lot of ground. And so for those of you who always loved consuming it that way, um, you know, this is a, a great day. But I'm going to walk through basically everything that's in the dctoday.com uh, right now. So those watching the video and those listening on the podcast can get the same kind of information. Um, the first thing I want to do is just get today's market action out of the way. And then there's some bigger picture stuff we'll, we'll cover the, uh, market last night, the futures were down about 75 points. They stayed down right in that range all evening, not much activity. Um, and then even this morning at about three 30 in the morning Pacific time, when I got up, they were only down 50. And so you, you didn't have a whole lot of movement, particularly considering the rally of last week. And considering the the huge instability uh, going on right now in the cryptocurrency market and various concerns about contagion there, which I think are pretty poorly thought uh, concerns. But then um, the market opened about flat, and then the Dow did recover, and you really saw um, a, a pretty healthy morning for markets, e even though Nasdaq was staying down quite a bit. Even it went from down 1% to, to positive territory at some point, a few, a couple, about two hours, two and a half hours before the close. And then, um, so at one point, the Dow ended up being up 211 points, and the Dow closed down 211 points. And uh, let's see, was it exactly 10 minutes? It was about 15 minutes. Um, when I look at the tick by tick, uh, uh, action on the day, you, you really just saw the market take all of its leg down in the last 15 minutes of trading. But nothing severe. Dow was down 0.6%. The S&P was down 0.9%. The NASDAQ was down 1.1%. And so, you know, something like this, something much worse than this was probably expected after the big rally last week. Um, Coming into today, 56%, and I don't imagine anything would have moved enough today to be to change here. 56% of the S&P 500 holdings were now above their 200-day moving average. And so in the August rally, where, where the markets had rallied quite a bit um, and, then, and then tanked in the second half of August and into September, that number got to 51% of the S&P. Um, and we were as low as about, I think, 18, 19, 20 percent of the S&P just two weeks ago. It was above its 200 day moving average. So it, moving up to 56 percent is is a big move very quickly. And it's uh, much higher than you had. Uh, not much higher, but but noticeably higher than it was at the last big market rally in August. Um, the thing I'm re uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is not because I think that is a sign that therefore we're all free and clear of markets, uh, which is what a lot of technical analysts are looking to for breadth and depth. And it also isn't because I necessarily um, care, <laughs> to be quite candid. I do find it very interesting that the breadth of the market is such that 56% of the holdings in the S&P are above their 200-day moving average yet none of the big tech names are. This, to me, is a sign of internal strength in the market decoupled from reliance on the past winners, from reliance on the strength at the top, the biggest market capitalization names that are not participating. It's very interesting. Um, now, where are we getting this kind of market rally? The dollar index is down 5.3%. Um, in, in the last couple of weeks, the 10 year bond yield today closed down, uh, excuse me, closed up to 3.86%. So up just three basis points on the day, but recall it was down about 40 basis points last week. So you've had a huge rally in bonds. You've had a huge rally in stocks, uh, um, but uh, the dollar dropping 
and the bond yields dropping appear to be at the center of all of it. But it's more than just bond yields. This was a huge pres uh, a theme, rather, when we got back from our New York trip. And that is the volatility of the bond index. We talk so much about volatility of equities. And when you look at the move index, which is sort of like a VIX that, that measures volatility of the S&P or fear around the S&P, the move index measuring kind of volatility levels around the bond index, uh, the bond market, has uh, dropped substantially in just the last couple of weeks. So what will it uh, hold there? Will it stabilize? I don't know. But I do know that less bond market volatility um, than we've been having as a prerequisite for more healthy and stable financial markets. So the top performing sector of the day was healthcare. It was just up a few basis points. The bottom was real estate, got hammered down 2.65%. Um, one of the things we did is add a video clip um, with me talking about Bitcoin and crypto. The only reason we've added it though is not because I was giving my most recent commentary from today or from last week, but it's commentary I gave two years ago, and it just seemed uh, apropos to uh, use it now. Um, this implosion of a $32 billion Bitcoin exchange company that really had become one of the prominent crypto companies as a custodian of uh, digital coins, as a lender. Um, they had a number of business models uh, globally. And uh, now this thing blowing up is really led to a lot of instability in the crypto world, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, but again, you're talking about two, over $2 trillion of value that has erupted, that has uh, uh, imploded. And, and there's charts to that effect, and then also charts around the kind of crypto exposed basket of securities, even beyond just the drop in value of various digital coins. You have an ecosystem that has really, you know, been built around the cryptocurrency world, and you see that uh, basket of crypto-related securities down seventy to eighty percent, sometimes more, related to exchanges and and whatnot. So, it's um, a very significant implosion, and my view continues to be that it will be bad. Perhaps it gets a lot worse. I, I wouldn't bet against that. I, I wouldn't bet for it. I just don't I, don't, I don't know what people think they know to be able to formulate an intelligent opinion on that. People, it, it's a lot of speculation. Um, however, what I would say is that the contagion effect, I think, is significantly overthought. I just simply believe there's individuals who are going to feel a lot of pain but I don't believe it is contagious uh, to the rest of the economy. Um, as far as the uh, earnings front, real quickly, as we get ready to kind of wrap up our last week of Q3 earnings reporting, we're already over 92% reported. Hotel, restaurant, and leisure industry, their earnings are up 97% versus a year ago. Uh, a major story there and wonderful for hotel investors. All right, so just a couple of minor little news items that in the past would have become the entire uh, subject of a DC today. President Biden met with President Xi Jinping of China at the G20. It was a little sidebar meeting as the leaders um, at the G20 are convening. Nothing noteworthy to report on it other than that it happened. And I'm quite confident that one of the analysts that we heavily rely upon is going to have quite a bit of great intelligence on this, and we're going to wait to, to see what comes out of that. Um, a federal judge it has indeed uh, ruled President Biden's student loan forgiveness um, unconstitutional and ordered it blocked, which means it goes up to the next appeal. And I think it was a district court that has now done the block. I imagine it goes to federal appellate court and will very likely end up in the Supreme Court. Uh, but as of now, it's been invalidated, but it just it, we, it now cycles through to the next phase. Um, we are assuming at this point that the Democrats will take control of the Senate with the question being or, or maintain control. And, that, and that, that's kind of the whole key phrase here. People talk about what's gone on in the midterms. There's been tight races. There's still some House seats not, not fully clarified. Um, some of the governor races were closer than people expected, and some uh, Senate and governor races had different outcomes. But when all said and done, there wasn't much change. 
And in the Senate, there wasn't a single incumbent that's lost their job. Um, the only reason why the Republicans could end up seeing the Democrats gain one seat in the Senate is because um, Pat Toomey in Pennsylvania did retire, therefore he wasn't reelected, and the Democrats flipped that seat. But no other flipping took place. Uh, they did not flip Georgia uh, unless they do so in a runoff. And even if they do do that, it won't be enough because they lost Pennsylvania, having not flipped either Arizona or Nevada. Uh, Nevada looking like um, Senator Adam Laxalt uh, is going to end up coming up short by a very, very, very tight margin. And so that's the state of uh, affairs there. And the House, it looks like I, you can look at the NBC, the Politico, the MSNBC, they all have different expectations. Um, I think it will be about uh, seven to nine seats when all said and done. It could be 12. Um, it may even be as little as three to five. But I think if you meet in the middle there, there's a better case to be made. And so, you know, my take, by the way, I went back this weekend and was reading some stuff I had written on all this over the summer. And it was not just that I would have been right on everything I said um, if I had not kind of gotten pulled and swayed a bit in the last couple of weeks by the polls, by the apparent shift in national sentiment. But what I was saying in the summertime not only proved to be accurate, it proved to be accurate for those reasons. And so certain candidate quality issues and um, really what voter uh, theme priorities are proved to be much different than people expected. And the results are what they are. Um, I don't think there's much to be said on the market front when gridlock means gridlock. And whether you have gridlock with seven votes or gridlock with 30 votes, and whether you uh, moved the Senate or failed to keep or, 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 or didn't move it, you know, regardless of what side we're talking about here, um, the Democrats you know, didn't have a great run at getting some of the significant tax and spend legislation in after that initial COVID bill with um, the majority position in the House. So now they had Senate before 50 uh, or 51 and they keep it. And, and and yet they've lost the House. I, I don't think that there's a reason to believe that any market impacting legislation is coming. Some people could look at the state of Congress as an improvement. Some could look at it like it went the other way. Most probably look at it like it barely really moved much. But when all said and done, I don't think there's anything impactful here other than where it's going to bring us into 2023, 24, the next election cycle. That's really where markets will start to look forward from, from here. Um, other policy issues real quick. China um, has cut uh, the quarantine period for inbound travel travelers. They scrapped uh, much of their flight ban. Um, really just further evidence of how much they're softening on the futility of their COVID zero theory, COVID zero policy. So the CPI news on Thursday, um, biggest bond day rally I think I'd ever seen on, on Thursday. The tenure following 33 basis points. Um, the, the headline rate for inflation in CPI, it was at 8.2%. It dropped to 7.7. The court rate was at 6.3. It had been 6.6. Uh, and yet energy and food were both higher. And so when you see these uh, overall levels coming down, even with some of the big contributors going higher, you know that A, as I pointed out time and time again, a huge contribution to the high CPI number is what we call OER, owner's equivalent rent. It makes up about 30% of the 40% that is CPI in shelter. And I, I think most people are well aware that shelter is not really going up to the degree that their lagging indicator calculation indicates. And so the inflation direction seems to be appearing uh, to be moving in the right direction. And that has totally changed Fed expectations, where you're now looking at um, 50 basis points almost assured in December instead of 75. And then you're looking at a Fed funds terminal rate out to like June of next year that has come down by about 20 basis points, 25. So big change in expectations. Um, I, I would say that hearing Vice Chair Lane, uh, uh, Lail, excuse me, Lail Brainerd, talk about um, uh, slowing down 
um, and pausing uh, before their next meeting, slowing the pace of rate hikes after the next meeting, that kind of stuff. Um, you heard a European central bank member allude to this notion that they're basically within reach of peak inflation. This stuff sounds like central bank are starting to get dovish. Um, all right, I'll wrap it up. There's an against doomsdayism talking about how we have to look at how much things are better in the concept of how much time it takes to affect them, not just price. When you adjust for time, it's really quite amazing what kind of progress we've made in certain key areas. And there is a couple Ask David questions that I lumped together to give you a better understanding of where I am and on what the Fed is doing and ought to be doing. Very brief, but hopefully helpful. I got to leave it there. We've covered a lot of ground. There's some housing to, uh, uh, factoid you're going to want to grab out of the dctoday.com as well. So let me leave it there and come back to you tomorrow with our podcast, with our video, and with the short abridged market synopsis. But today you got plenty to chew on. There may be questions about the Fed, about crypto, about this implosion of the crypto company, about uh, the election. You send those questions to us, we're going to answer them. Questions at the Bonson Group. Com. Thank you for listening to and watching the DC Today. Mm -hmm.